Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, I think this is week eight. We're about halfway through the program and uh, uh, excited about the progress everyone has made and the team efforts and uh, really looking forward to next week's uh, on the ground meeting in your communities. And so as you continue to build your agendas and, and plan the day, uh, just let uh, 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 just want you to know that uh, we're at your service and Tracy and I will be attending all the meetings and I'm not sure if other team members will be popping in uh, uh, as we go, but uh, uh, really look forward to uh, seeing you, meeting you and uh, being in your communities and get a real feel for the on the ground conditions, uh, your assets, uh, the things going on in your community. And however we can help uh, uh, receive input from your community or uh, provide uh, information to your community through my visit, really looking forward to accomplishing both of those tasks. So um, excited about that. Weather looks like it's gonna be uh, fine. No blizzards in the Midwest next week so far. So um, that's all great. Uh, we had had a request from McLean County about uh, uh, kind of some marketing flyers, trifold brochures and so on. And I wasn't all that successful on that, but Robbie's got a couple of documents that I sent him that he'll put in the chat with a link to them. And uh, uh, just a couple of communication pieces from the communities. And, you know, that would be a great task for someone to take on as just harvesting a bunch of broadband marketing communications, messaging kind of information from other communities, from broadband providers and so on to, to see what those messages are that uh, people find effective and always nice to borrow concepts and ideas and, and, and so on. So maybe we'll, we'll get our broadband lab team on that and see if we can uh, get that going a little bit. Um, and so uh, that's about it right now. I just uh, uh, excited about the progress we've made and <clears throat> again, uh, uh, seeing you in your communities. I'm gonna turn it over to Adrian, who's gonna announce our speakers today. Adrian. Yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, well, I have to say these are always a couple of weeks. Last week when we heard about uh, fiber and middle mile and this week when we heard about wireless, where I told my McLean County team that even I continue to learn things from these technical presentations. And so I would say to everybody that uh, don't feel like if you don't get it the first time around that it means that uh, you will never get it because sometimes this technical information can be complex. We do end up leaving the slides with you to study and we're always available for questions. I want to introduce you to the three gentlemen who are joining us from the Wireless Research Center based in the um, uh, triangle. What do you call it? The technology triangle in, uh, <laughs> in North Carolina. And uh, I met Jerry Hayes. Uh, I think it's been probably, I don't know, a year plus, well, maybe close to two years that Jerry and I have been talking um, once a month about what he's doing uh, in a variety of different areas that his nonprofit is interested in. And so rather than explain uh, what that does, I'm gonna turn it over to him, but let me introduce his other two team members, Mike Bartz, uh, who will I guess be running the slides. He's in the upper left of my screen and Ko Takamizawa, who uh, is next to Jerry, at least on my screen. <laughs> uh, all three of these guys are engineers. I will only tell you one funny story. About two weeks ago, I was on the phone with four engineers and two GIS experts and me. And uh, actually it was just wonderful uh, because I will tell you, I understood 100% of it and they were uh, very kind to me in terms of making sure that I did. Uh, but it was a wonderful conversation, very collaborative. 
Uh, one of the gentlemen that was on that call, Quentin Flippin, is also here today. Um, and so anyway, let me turn it over to Jerry without any further ado and ask him to give some background about WRC and his team. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Good, good morning, everybody. And thank you for having us here. Um, as, as Adrian mentioned, I'm Jerry Hayes with the Wireless Research Center. We're a nonprofit 501c3 organization that has two missions. One is to advance wireless technologies and promote economic development. We're, we're here to really empower consumers and demystify the technology. And our speakers are two of our lead staff members, Mike Bartz and Ko Takamizawa. Um, they're gonna go through um, many of the technologies that, uh, that, that will help enhance the application of broadband. Um, and, and please feel free to ask questions. We come from, uh, from commercial backgrounds, uh, not so much, we have academic histories, but we, we do a lot of work with uh, the commercial sector. Um, and uh, I'll let Mike and Co move from there. And then as Adrian mentioned, Mike will be doing do the presentation. Way to go. Sorry. Hello, my name is Kota Kamzao. I'm a technical manager at the uh, the engineering branch of the Wireless uh, Research Center called the uh, WRC Technologies. Um, Mike and I have a long uh, um, um, we, we've actually met at the graduate school and been together on and off for a long, long time. And so, and yeah, like Jerry said, we, we've had uh, pretty broad uh, experiences in different sectors of the uh, industries and, and hope that we can, our experience can help with uh, what you guys are trying to achieve. Mike? Yeah. All right, uh, Mike Bartz, uh, senior engineer at the Wireless Research Center. Uh, and as Co mentioned, he and I have long history together. Uh, although this is actually the first time we've worked together the last four or five years, <laughs> but we've known each other for a long time. Uh, and uh, we've had similar technical backgrounds. We've all had a wild, wide variety of experiences uh, in government, uh, commercial, consumer products over the years. And so um, we're here to try to, to, hopefully today we're gonna to help demystify some of the aspects of wireless for, for you guys. And while we're not gonna make you wireless experts, we're gonna hopefully try to uh, at least give you so that when you start hearing some of these buzzwords being tossed around, you'll have some idea of how wireless will fit in as part of a piece of a puzzle. So I guess, um, that's it. I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started. Okay, make sure everybody can see that. Good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Always good to make sure. So today we're going to talk about uh, wireless technologies and with a, with a focus on rural broadband and for agriculture. And I know up until now you've mainly your, your conversations have been on wired technologies, uh, which, you know, in, in an ideal world, we'd all love to have one gigabit fiber running to our house and to everything we want it to do with. Um, but there's times when that's not possible. And also, particularly in a place like uh, the farm, where uh, wireless technology definitely is a complement, if not necessarily a replacement uh, for those broadband connections. There we go. So today what we want to do is, is discuss some of these wireless technologies and understand what their capabilities are and how they will fit in. Uh, and mainly also understand, just so you recognize some of these buzzwords that uh, surround them and, and understand how this technology fits together. At WRC, as we look at this we don't see wireless. Wireless isn't the answer. It's part of the answer. And depending upon your particular needs, and that goes down even to the perhaps the individual farm or the individual household, 
Uh, they have different needs and they'll have different requirements. Now, almost everybody here, I'm sure, already has some experience with wireless. Even if you don't think about it, you've got a cell phone, that's wireless. You've got a Wi-Fi router in your house, and that's wireless. Uh, those are part of the technologies, but there's lots of other technologies that we want to talk about today. So one of the things that we want to consider when we start talking about wireless as part of the mix of the solutions is there's fixed access and what we call mobility. Now, the fixed access is what you guys have been talking about most to now when you talk about fiber, or you talk about cable, or you know, any of the other wired technologies. They basically bring you internet access to a point, whether it's a desktop or a router somewhere, and you plug in and, and you know, but not many of us today um, do our work or have our you know, needs for connectivity just at a fixed location. And that's where we get into what we call mobility. Now, mobility is everything from the laptop you carry around your house, hooked up with Wi-Fi, to your phone, or maybe in the case of agriculture, your office today might be on top of a combine somewhere uh, five miles from your home, and you still have a need for a data connection there. So uh, that's a mobility connection. And then considering the wireless capabilities, you've got to look at range versus speed of the data rate. Um, basically, the, the higher data rate that you want to achieve, usually, usually the shorter the range is. So uh, if you have a low data rate, you can go much, much further distances than you can if you've got a high data rate. Again, depends on your application, and we'll talk about some of that. The last thing I want maybe make you aware of is that the technology versus the frequency or the spectrum that's being used for the wireless technology. Now, really and truly technology and frequency, or the spectrum that's being used, they're really independent, but they're not independent because typically commercial, commercial offerings link these two together. So be aware that when we talk about one, there's usually, if we talk about a particular frequency, there's usually a certain technology is associated with it, but there can be, you know, there, there are two things that they're not inexorably linked together, but they tend to be linked together in most commercial offerings. So we start talking about these different wireless technologies, what's behind that name? So when we talk about Wi-Fi, we talk about cellular or any of the other things, um, that's a name that's given to the technology. And behind that is uh, basically three main things. And one of them is the radio spectrum or the frequency in which it's being used at. And again, that's not necessarily tied to the technology, but in most commercial offerings, it sort of is. But it could be, you know, you've got to be aware that there's, there's some radio spectrum that's being used there. Also, each technology has its own protocols. Think of the protocol as the language the technology uses to talk from one device to another. And those languages generally are not directly compatible. That's why your Wi-Fi router can't talk to your cellular network. Uh, they speak different languages. They're also on different uh, radio frequencies as well, different spectrum. So that's another reason they can't. But even if they were on the same spectrum, they couldn't talk to one another because the protocols are different. And lastly, there's the hardware that's involved in making all this happen. And that's usually in at least most commercial offerings of services, uh, pretty specialized. So it's usually uh, dedicated to a particular technology. But all of this, wireless, these wireless technologies, their goal ultimately is to get you connected back to the network. In this case, we're talking a wired network. So whether it's cellular, whether it's Wi-Fi or something else, ultimately you're trying to connect back to a wired connection somewhere. And that connection is the, gives you access to the broader network. So here I'm just listing a, a bunch of the different buzzwords and names, and we'll talk about these in a little more in depth. But just to give an idea for fixed wireless access, and this fixed wireless access is typically what would be used as a replacement for a wired connection. Uh, in situations where wired connections are 
not either feasible economically or for other reasons, how do we replace it? We can't get the fiber to the house or we can't get the, the cable to the house. How do, we, how do we get there? It's also sometimes called, you'll hear it referred to as the last mile solution. Yeah, uh, no, I'm can whoever's on uh, be muted? Thank you. Okay. So, so you'll also sometimes hear this referred to as a last mile solution because, um, again, it, it literally is the last mile, although it may not be a mile. Um, it's that connection from a wired access point, or to, which has a wired connection, I should say, to the network, to uh, the house or the barn or wherever. And that can be. LTE, which is cellular, uh, WiMAX, CBRS, we'll talk about, stands for Citizens Broadband Radio Service, uh, could be a point-to-point -point, uh, microwave link um, or other, is usually uh, provided by a WISP, a wireless internet service provider, or it could be satellite. Um, satellite obviously isn't really a last mile, it's a lot, lot longer than a mile, but it's still the same solution. It's given you a wire, a, an internet connection where you can't get a wire in, perhaps. And then I talked about mobility. And so that typically is the mobile network we see, and that's cellular, 4G, 5G, millimeter wave. Um, the 4G, the, the names for that, there's lots of names associated with different parts of this, but uh, 4G is typically, nowadays you'll hear LTE, LTE plus, or advanced, or even gigabit LTE which honestly, that was a new one for me. Um, I, I've never seen gigabit LTE in the wild, although I'm sure it exists somewhere. And then the newest thing, of course, is 5G. And you may sometimes see it referred to as 5G NR. The NR stands for new radio. Uh, and then lastly, uh, mobile connection can be, uh, for example, Iridium. And that's a satellite connection. However, it's a low data rate, mainly voice, but can be data as well. Uh, but that's a, a small handheld that provides a satellite connectivity. Now, I put an asterisk on a couple of these because they're not really broadband, but I wanted to include them in here because they can be part of the solution that you need. Also, we see Wi-Fi. Almost everybody probably has experience with Wi-Fi. You probably have a Wi-Fi router in your house. Um, we typically think of Wi-Fi as providing that communication just within, our, within the house. But you'll find out that uh, actually newer versions of Wi-Fi, they're, they're, they're stretching their, their range nowadays. And lastly, two types of two technologies that are, are really, really not broadband. They're, they're low, beta, low data rate, relatively short, well, not necessarily short range, but they're low data rate solutions, which are Bluetooth. Again, you may be well familiar with if you have Bluetooth earphones or a Bluetooth speaker. Um, and there's LoRa. Uh, and LoRa is often seen as an Internet of Things solution, but it has some capabilities that, again, has particular applications, perhaps on the on uh, for agriculture, where uh, again you don't need large data rates, but it uh, may be for uh, economical and uh, long-range sorts of things. So basically, we will look at two scenarios here. One is the internet to the home office or the farm. And, and this is the place, this is where typically you would love to have a wired connection. Um, that's where you want your biggest data pipe to be coming in. And that would be the source of that. So, but sometimes you may not be able to get a wired connection. And we'll talk about, again, some of those solutions for it. The other one we want to talk about is internet on the farm. And that's where things get a lot more complicated and at least from my perspective, more interesting too, because there we have a lot of bandwidth requirements that are very dependent on the end user devices. So on the farm, you've got, you may have a large data pipe, hopefully coming into the home, but then you have a need for data communications or could be voice communications even out on the farm where it's, this is the mobility part of things usually. You may have a, a laptop, or a piece of a farm equipment that has uh, a need for data connections. And that can be anywhere from a moderate to a high data rate, depending upon what the application is. Another example would be UAVs, as they're becoming more and more popular. 
those video has a relatively high data rate. However, the control and, and data may be low to moderate data rates that are needed for that. And this is one application in particular where low latency is, is important. Now, latency, if you're not familiar with that term, it basically is how long does it take for my data to get from point A to point B? And at a certain point, if it takes too long for the data to get there, the network takes care of making sure the data gets there. But if it takes too long to get there, that can be a problem. On video, you'll see this as stop and stuttering of the video. Um, and you may, in, in case of, of control signals, for example, to a UAV, if you have a really high latency um, and you're trying to fly the UAV, you may find that it becomes a bit erratic because it's taking, you know, the, the loop is taking too long to occur. Uh, it does one thing and you tell it to do another and it takes too long. By the time it does what you tell it to do, something else has happened. And so it ends up uh, being difficult to control. The last one I want to put on there is sensors. So particularly in agriculture, sensors can be uh, for can be temperature, moisture, humidity, or even um, you know, uh, detection sensors for, uh, for example, um, making sure no one's getting into a field or whatever. Those are usually low data rates. So there's no need to have a high, you, know, you, you don't need fiber to a sensor. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. There's, there's a, too much um, capability there for what is usually a very low data rate. And so again, what is the appropriate solution for that? So this is, this is a nice little uh, plot I put together and hopefully give you some idea of the different types of range versus the data rate or the bandwidth that is capable of each of these technologies. Now you notice there's a lot of overlap in these different technologies. Um, so again, there's no one answer usually, uh, but there's a range of answers and you've kind of got to find out what one meets your needs. But uh, the big one you notice there is cellular. Cellular kind of has, can do a lot of things. The range can be good. I can also have di high data rates. Uh, and again, very much dependent upon who your provider is and where you're at. Um, the fixed wireless is typically a high data rate uh, area, but it's also also long range. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap in that. Uh, Wi-Fi is actually becoming more and more capable with the newer generations. So again, a lot of overlaps in some cases with fixed and with cellular. Uh, Bluetooth, again, and sensors are typically low data rate, but they also usually a lot of times need to have long range to them. The, the one outlier out there is the MMW, which stands for millimeter wave technology. I wanted you to put this on here. It's not something that you're likely to see anytime soon, but the capability is there and you will be seeing it touted. So, but just be aware, it's very high data rate, but it's also very short range. And again, this is just sort of a, a plot to give you an idea of the capabilities of the different technologies. So here, this is your typical scenario of, of a fixed wireless access. So we have a house, for whatever reason, we can't get a wired service, so how would we do this? We would have some sort of WiMAX, which, uh, or, which is usually provided by a, a wireless internet service provider, a WISP, could be LTE, or it could be CBRS, that provides you some uh, a data, a connect, data connection to the house or the office. And then from there, typically, of course, you go to a Wi-Fi router, which provides you know, access to other devices in the house. So these technologies typically can give you data rates of 5 to 100 megabits per second. And depending upon the terrain and the service, um, range can be a half a mile to 10 miles uh, that's needed. So again, a uh, LTE cellular provider can also can usually provide several, you know, several miles, and there's enough uh, saturation in most areas, although not all of them, where you can get an LTE signal. And some of these other, others, the uh, WiMAX and CBRS can provide 
high or higher data rates. Typically, the end user house, you need a modem for receiving it, and usually an external antenna is preferred, but in some cases, uh, simply an internal modem with a, uh, within the house with an antenna can be sufficient. So of these 4G cellular is probably the most common that's available. Uh, 4G LTE, by the way, has, it stands for long-term evolution. So everything nowadays is in 4G is, is LTE or some other variant like LTE advanced. And you see by this table here, uh, typically 15 to 20 megabits down uh, or an upload of 10 to 15 megabits. And that's usually that's you know, pretty common these days of what you can get uh, from cell phone type service. Uh, the LTE advanced, if it exists in the area, I can up that quite a bit. Now you're getting 50 to 80 megabits down, 15 to 20 megabits up. Uh, however, LTE advanced its coverage, it just depends upon the provider as to what they have. Uh, your, your typical 4G modem looks a lot like a Wi-Fi like wi modem. In fact, a lot of times you'll find that these modems may be combined together. Uh, it may have 4G capability into it as well as Wi-Fi, so you only need one box to put in your house. Two other types of 4G cellular capabilities you may see mentioned is LTE CAT M1. And that's a good service for low data rates that you need it for sensors. So typically one megabit per second up and down. Uh, reason for that is it's it's a cheaper service, but you'll see that and, and for something that's got to be uh, doesn't require a lot of data. Uh, this is not what you would want for your connectivity to a house. But again, if you're out somewhere, you have a sensor uh, that you don't need a lot of data. That's one you'll see. You'll also see NBIOT, which is narrowband Internet of Things. Uh, that's another form of LTE that you may see, you may come across and be referred to. Yeah, you know, it's an even lower data rate, which again translates to a cheaper service, but for things like sensors, could be uh, very important to use. Mike, I have a question yeah. for you. Sure. So, uh, is that NB? Uh, IoT, is that a service that is common for somebody like Verizon to sell? Yes. Yeah, almost all the providers will provide this. Uh, you, you know, you, you won't go into your, Ver typically go into your Verizon store and they'll, they'll, they'll know what it is, uh, but somebody there does. <laughs> it, it, is, it is a service that's, that's well, it, it, these are all part of the cellular standard so there, they should be available on all the networks. Mike, okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, uh, NBLOT stand for again. Uh, Long-term evolution is technically what it stands for, uh, but uh, because when 4G first came out, uh, it was just 4G, <laughs> right. and and they said, okay, well, we're going to figure out how we're going to, you know, increase the capabilities. So the cellular Gs, if you will, they're generations. Each generation, which coincidentally is, it works out that a new generation comes along about every decade. Um, each generation is a major upgrade in the standard and the capabilities of what the network can do. And part, part of this is marketing, uh, so they can sell you on it, but it's, it's, a, it's a way of telling you, okay, we have new capabilities and here's what we can do. So. LTE was seen as the long-term evolution of 4G when it came along. And of course, now we're, we've kind of reached the, reaching the end of LTE, uh, where we're going to go to 5G is what's out now. So that's the new generation of things. Right. And then um, uh, the NB IoT? Uh, yeah, that's, that's narrowband IoT, Internet of Things. Oh, and again, okay. yeah. And, and again, you see, it's a much, much lower data rate. Uh, you know, CAT M1 is one megabit, whereas uh, NBIOT is 26 kilobits. So again, a very small amount of data, but again, an application where you've got a, a sensor, for example, that just has a small amount of data, it needs to send back periodically. Um, rather than having to 
pay a higher price for higher capability that you don't need, there is this lower tier capability that's available as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the new kid on the block is 5G. And I'm sure everybody's heard of 5G. And the question is, what does 5G mean? Well, 5G is, is truly a, um, a, a new step or, or it's a complete change and improvement in, in capabilities. In fact, 4G and 5G are not compatible. They've typically, they've tried to maintain at least somewhat backward compatibility between when they go to a new generation, um, at least you know, for some period of time that occurs. Uh, 5G is, is truly a rethinking and the capabilities are much, much higher. Uh, higher speeds, as you can see, one to 10 gigabits uh, per second uh, maximum. And again, that's theoretical, uh, but typically more than 50 megabits per second is on average. And I'll show you this little picture uh, up in the upper right-hand corner there. This is sometimes seen as the, called the, the, the tripod of 5G. And what it shows is the three legs of it that are the three important features are, one is, is the massive internet of things. That is, it serves massive numbers of users, uh, and, but they're not always uh, high bandwidth users. But that's the second one down there, the enhanced mobile broadband. It's, it's high data rates, but also for mobile capabilities. So um, we're now talking about hundreds of megabits per second uh, mobile, not just fixed. And then the third one is says mission critical control, and that's the low latency. And that's where we're not only given high data rates, but we're also doing low latency so that things that are mission critical, we have to have that information right now. We can't afford a delay. Uh, again, the UAV is a really good example of that. For example, UAV control or video, uh, you, you don't want any, any latencies or issues or higher latencies that can cause problems with that. 5G doesn't require all of these. Any one of these will qualify for 5G capability, but you know, ideal world, you get all three. <laughs> so um, anyway, the, so most of the 5G you're gonna see is, is what's called sub six gigahertz. And here, they're going to be using the same frequency bands that we have on 4G now. Plus, there's some new bands that are available as well. So over time, just like we did with 3G, although 3G has been, has been basically old for a decade, um, most 3G networks are now shut down completely. But I know that AT&T, I think, had some 3G networks that were still up and running as of a year or two ago, even though... 3G basically was deprecated uh, over a decade ago, uh, or at least it was being, well over a decade ago, it was being replaced by 4G. Same thing is gonna happen with 5G. 4G is gonna still be around uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future, but as 5G capabilities come in or are deployed, then there will be eventually, the 4G networks will be shut down in favor of the 5G. And Part of the trick to doing this to get the higher bandwidth is they're going to combine multiple frequency bands in order to create, to create the data rate. One of the things that 4G, although some 4G, advanced 4G has done this, um, it's, it's still not as widespread. 5G is going to be doing this more. They'll be using multiple bands and sending the data simultaneously uh, so you can split it up. So uh, if you have a, a 10 megahertz, a 10 megabit per second channel, say, um, if I can take five of those and combine them together, I can now give you 50 megabits. Uh, I'm using more spectrum to do it, but I can give you a higher data rate in order to do that. And that's part of what 5G is doing. The really, really sexy part of 5G that people that uh, get sold on the marketing is this really, really high bandwidth. And this is the millimeter wave. Uh, these are at very, very high frequencies, 28 gigahertz and above. Uh, so that give you an idea, 28 gigahertz is getting up into the range of where your direct TV satellite is. Uh, it's, it's very high frequency stuff. So you can have very wide bandwidth, gigabit per second data rates or more. However, <laughs> at these high frequencies, the range is very short and it's also subject to blockage by trees, by buildings. Uh, it's not going to have very good penetration into buildings. 
so you're not likely to see this deployed in rural areas in the foreseeable future. It's mainly going to be deployed in, in cities and urban areas where you've got high population density and where they need um, the capability of, of a lot of data. But I want you to be aware of it because it's, it's a neat technology. You'll see it talked about a lot. Uh, but it's, it's something that is going to be in, in small places. However, there are applications of this where maybe you need connectivity from point to point, and it might be used for that as well. Uh, in which case now you could replace a fiber, for example, by a couple of hops of millimeter wave point to point links. But again, that's kind of where your, if you will, your middle mile or other providers will be doing that. It's not gonna be available to the, the consumer really. So WiMAX, this is the one that uh, has been around for a while, although the uh, hasn't been as popular. It stands for Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access. And this is a really common, it can be a common last mile broadband solution. And it has these bands at uh, 2.3, 2.5, and 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, essentially, it's, it's, this is what you're, you're with, the wireless internet service providers. They may use WiMAX. Um, and, you know, basically there's a tower somewhere, typically they'll have, and that's serving uh, their customers within a five or 10 mile radius. Uh, you can get really good data rates out of this, um, you know, 37 to over 300 megabits per second down, 17 to 300, over 300 megabits per second uplink. And so that, that's a really good solution for your sort of last mile uh, thing, but it's that's this is what you'll see the, a lot of WISP using is is this technology. There's some other technologies they may be using, but uh, this is really what this was designed for. Um, just I just haven't seen a lot of this. There is some of it out there is out there, but it's it's not as popular as I would think it would have been. There's a a new technology. Um, oops. There we go. There we go. Uh, there's a new technology on the on the on the, the market, if you will, called CBRS, and this is Citizens Broadband Radio Service, not to be confused with CB Radio. Uh, sounds a whole lot alike, and, and the FCC. I don't know why they they, they chose this, but they did. Uh, this is a brand new service that was just authorized in 2020, and there's 150 megahertz of bandwidth at three and a half gigahertz that's available. Now this is an unusual, it's, it's an unusual service in that uh, it's, it, it has some interesting capabilities and interesting structure. It's a combination of licensed and unlicensed users. So the licenses are sold by county, which is really interesting because the FCC has never done that before. They usually sell the licenses by uh, what they call it, metropolitan area or something like that. Uh, you know, so um, Chicago would be a metropolitan area. They would sell a license for Chicago. But for this one, they actually did it by county. And so county by county throughout the United States, they, they had these auctioned off these licenses. Now, there's a there's there's licensed users, which actually they're called priority access users or, or priority access licenses, PALs. They get access priority access i'll say to half of the band the other half of the band is available for the pal users and for unlicensed users so you don't necessarily have to have a license to use this uh, spectrum and over here on this, this picture shows you this is this three-tier uh, operation uh, in the band and one is the incumbents the incumbents in this case are the government and mostly it's naval radar. Uh, being in Illinois, I don't think you guys have to worry about naval radars too much. Uh, <laughs> but for those, for those of us up here on the coast, even though we're several hundred miles from the coast, uh, believe it or not, uh, we still have to worry about naval radars. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's then there's that the, the, beyond, beyond the, the incumbents, of course, they have first priority. If they're using it, they get it. Um, if they're not using it, however, the priority access licenses have priority to get access to it. And they can use the, the channels 
And then beyond that, if nobody else is using it, the general access users or the unlicensed users can now do it. Now, the interesting thing about this is it's called dynamic spectrum sharing. This is a new, actually an experiment of sorts that the FCC is doing. In order to use this spectrum, you can't just go turn a radio on. Even if you have a license, you can't just go turn your radio on and say, I'm going to start using this. Uh, you actually have to coordinate your operation with what's called a spectrum access. It's a SAS. And Jerry, can you help me with this? Or Co? <laughs> I can't remember the last S. But it's anyway, there's basically the government has, has uh, appointed uh, several organizations whose job is to coordinate the spectrum access and so before you're allowed to go on and do it you have to connect connect to the spectrum access licensee and or like you know the server and say hey i want to use this channel and it will say okay you have a license to use this channel for some period of time and it goes on but again if you're a general access user you don't have to have a license to do this you just simply have to coordinate with the SAS in order to be able to use it. They'll let you use it without license. Now, the reason I mention this is this is a really good service that is possible for the last mile solution, but also for large farms, it may be even, you may even want to think about setting up your own CBRS system because what this can allow is private LTE networks. And we're going to, and you're going to see this, you're going to see, people creating these private LTE networks. It's the same technology that you're using on cell phones. And in fact, there are certain cell phones that are available and more will become available where if you put your SIM card in, you'll be able to use these CBRS frequencies. And so now, if it makes sense, you can, do, you can have your own network in this frequency range. So CBRS, I, I put in, actually went and looked up who has the licenses in the counties that are in this, uh, this program. And on the right here is the table of who the licensees of the are. Uh, Adrian, when she saw this, she questioned me whether I meant to put Wetterhorn Wireless in twice. And the answer is yes, I did, because they got two licenses. <laughs> so. Um, in these counties, these are who, who, who own those licenses, that they are the priority access licensees for these counties. Uh, it's an interesting mix. Throughout the rest of the country, or most of the country, a lot of these licensees, licenses were bought by the um, users, uh, by, by um, cellular providers. And they're going to use them to act to complement or to increase the capacity of their cellular networks. Uh, but there's some other ones that are in here that's kind of interesting. Mediacom, cable TV provider. Uh, the Wetterhorn is, is actually a, a shell company for the DISH network. Uh, the DISH network is, is building out their own 5G network, but they're also, they've got these licenses, so they're obviously going to use some of the spectrum as well. And the, the one truly cellular provider that's in your areas is uh, United States Cellular Corporation. They're there. Okay, I'm starting to run, run a little on time here, so I'm going to be a little bit, try to pick this up a little bit. Uh, the last one for fixed wireless is uh, satellite. Uh, so you'll see uh, there's a number of satellite uh, services available today. They're listed on the right there on the table. Um, they can have very good data rates. The one thing to be aware of is with satellite is latency can be an issue. Uh, so, for example, voice over IP and like this meeting here, Zoom meeting, uh, they generally don't work too well over satellite because the latency is, is, is too long. So the, the lag will be too high in the video. Uh, and lastly, the Iridium I mentioned before, they provide a low data rate uh, data and voice calls using handsets usually and portable devices. Now we get to some more localized types of, of services and Wi-Fi is one that's interesting because we're almost all, all of us, I'm sure, are familiar with Wi-Fi. We've got a Wi-Fi router in our house. Uh, our phone probably has Wi-Fi on it. And we connect uh, to it. There's a number of new versions of Wi-Fi that are out or are coming out. Uh, we typically think of Wi-Fi as being relatively short range. However, some of the new technologies, such as Wi-Fi 6, and there's even a Wi-Fi 7, which isn't in the picture, but I put it in the chart over here, 
Uh, they're increasing data rates, they're using new bands, and they're using a new technology called mesh networking, where you're not having to put up an access point uh, everywhere you need to go. So with Wi-Fi 6 or 7, you have other units, other, they're, they're basically like access points, but they mesh together to extend the range so you don't have to connect to a new one every time you move. It's, it's all one network. And hey, Mike? Yes. We're still on the satellite picture. Did you mean to oh, switch the slides? I'm sorry. Thank you. Let's see. Can I get this? Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, oh great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for catching that. I'm I'm looking at two screens here, so <laughs> I sometimes lose track of which one I'm on. Uh, the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi six and seven can now you're actually looking at being able to extend your Wi-Fi network reach out uh, over miles and have that same capability that you, you have in your house, but now you don't have to reconnect as you go out you know, on your farm, for example, if you have mesh network nodes out there. Uh, they will, it will follow that and you're still in the same network. Uh, also, Wi-Fi, there's a new one called Wi-Fi Halo, which is a low data rate and it's using a much lower frequency. So again, it has uh, a further reach, but it's typic typically a lot lower data rate, although it can go fairly high. So I included LoRa in here because I think there's a, a, there should be definitely an interest in LoRa, but it's not a broadband by any means. Relatively low data rate, um, 0.3 to 27 kilobits per second. The advantage of LoRa is it's fairly long range. We use typically in 915 megahertz band here in the United States. The sensors are low power and they will also communicate at a, low, at a long range over miles. Um, but they are also very, very low power. So typically a LoRa sensor can be put out somewhere and may, you could have it out there for a year or more and it can provide that data coming back uh, that you need, again, small amount of data, but it's important, you know, that again, for sensors that it, it can be put out there, it doesn't have to be maintained. Battery or a battery on a solar panel, small solar panel to help charge it, and it can last you know, a year or more out there before it needs to be touched. Again, this is more in the Internet of Things area, um, but it's a... Uh, Technology, I think that particularly for agricultural usage is, is uh, important. Lastly, I want to mention Bluetooth. Most of us are used to Bluetooth in terms of our, our uh, headphones or speakers or whatever. We typically think of it as a very short range technology and that's the way it was design, designed. However, there's some new versions of Bluetooth that are coming along uh, that are uh, called Bluetooth long range. Again, low data rates, but we're talking now a capability of going a kilometer or multiple kilometers at low data rates. So that's that's a, a, an interesting technology. Just you know, you're probably familiar with it, but you didn't realize that it actually can do newer versions can do things that uh, we aren't used to thinking about Bluetooth. Again, most of us think of Bluetooth as you know, 10 or 15, 20 feet type thing, but it can actually uh, capability for sensors can go actually further. So the typical scenario that we uh, look at, and uh, I changed this, Adrian, but I took your suggestion, but it didn't show up somehow. <laughs> anyway, um, so typically your, 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 your typical farm scenario would be uh, if you don't have, either have wired, a fiber or coax or something to bring your data in, or there's a wireless last mile solution, the WiMAX, the LTE, the CBRS. The satellite that usually comes into the house that's your big pipe that comes in and then from that we typically most of us will have a wi-fi modem or something in the house and that provides the service to our our small devices our laptops our tablets or whatever our streaming devices in the house uh, so that's a short range wireless solution but then on typical farms we may have we have the need for data communications out somewhere else, whether it's outbuildings, on your vehicles, or on the sensors. And that's where things like LTE can be a solution, Wi-Fi, CBRS, LoRa, or even Bluetooth as a solution for these. So it, again, it's 
we look at it as there's there's lots of pieces here to be put together and those pieces depend upon the individual user and their application um, particularly on farms because there's lots of different applications to have uh, i didn't i forgot to put a uav in here i meant to do that but that's another good one that uh, it may need capability that you know, we need, we need data that's not located just at the house. So in summary, what I've said here, friends, is the optimum solution is going to be a curated combination of all these different technologies. And that's very unique to each location and user. Um, in some cases, you may find that your options will be narrowed by the uh, existing equipment, uh, primarily things like uh, farm vehicles, uh, uh, the, the manufacturer is going to install a certain type of communications into it. And so you're going to, you're kind of locked into whatever they store and they, they put in there, uh, unless you're willing to do some extra work. But the last thing was I wanted to say, you know, don't, don't succumb to the marketing speak. Uh, there's a lot of marketing speak in, in wireless. Uh, even those of us who work in it, we can't keep up with all the buzzwords sometimes, but uh, just be careful that you understand what it's being done and, and look at the, the, the actual requirements and your needs versus what they want to sell you <laughs> because there's there's obviously some things are, are more appropriate or some applications are more appropriate for certain technologies and it's important to 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 uh, marry those up properly in order to uh, be able uh, to come up with an economical solution as well and for those of you get their presentation later i included a glossary in here uh, so that uh, all these buzzwords you've got a quick quick and easy place to go find out what they mean. Hopefully uh, they'll remind you of, of some of this talk here and uh, uh, hopefully you found it to be useful. And so that's Mike, my presentation. Question. Yeah, Mike, there's a question about uh, the ability for wireless to be symmetrical. Um, can it be symmetric? It, it, <laughs> If, if you're talking about the same up and down data rates, it can be, but typically not. Because what happens is, particularly for these last mile solutions, um, so you've typically got a, a, a large tower somewhere you're communicating to, and it will have a higher power uh, radio and higher gain antenna, so it can actually provide a larger downlink than what you can provide on the uplink. However, if you have an external antenna at your house, for example, um, you could get a lot closer to being symmetric. And you, and you might be able to get it to be symmetric. But typically, those you know, typical like LTE network, for example, is generally not designed to be symmetric because of that. You've, the, the user equipment is usually lower powered, uh, lower gain antenna, and so therefore it can't maintain the same data rate up as it can down. Mike, can you talk about the impact of trees on LIMAX or mm -hmm. LIMAX's ability to overcome trees? Yes. Uh, so vegetation at, at these higher frequencies, the higher in frequency you go, the more loss the vegetation will cause. So it, it, it makes the signal weaker. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, so a good example of this is, well, wintertime, uh, when the trees lose their leaves, deciduous trees at least use their, lose their leaves, there's not as much attenuation. And so you get a better signal. And then springtime comes and all the trees leaf out. And all of a sudden, you, you, your signal is not as good as it was. You're losing it. And what's even worse is when it rains and the, tree, and the leaves get wet, because wet leaves are the worst. <laughs> and so that's, that's where you've got to, you know, it, that's, that's physics. Uh, <laughs> where you, if you have a line of sight, to the tower, you're in the best situation you can be. Otherwise, you may have to deal with that. Are there any options for uh, for us that are in the hills with the trees? You, you can still these these tech. still the wireless technology will still work. It just there's more variability to it. Again, that's the trade-off. Uh, having to you know. Ideally, if you can have a wired connection, that's the that's the best of all possible worlds. It's the most stable. However, if you can't wire it, yeah, the, the lower frequency oper, uh, uh, lower frequencies that are used penetrate better. So, for example, LTE, uh, one of the, the bands that's typically used by I know AT and T uh, is 700 megahertz. Uh, 
that's a low frequency as far as cellular is concerned. So it penetrates much better as opposed to a 2.4 gigahertz signal. So, uh, and that would yeah. be the difference between the Verizon and the T-Mobile services, both marketed as 5G, but very different technologies. Well, they're different. Yeah, it, it again, it depends on the frequency, the, the bands they're using, the frequency bands they're using. And they they all have spectrums or bands that they've licensed both high and low, although you're right, I think and I think Verizon and T-Mobile tend to have the higher frequency bands. That's where they tend to have most uh, of their No, stuff. no, my nope. actually, nope. both, both uh, AT&T and Verizon have uh, 700 megahertz bands. Okay. And okay. T-Mobile actually owns a 600 megahertz band, that they, but they are still deploying. So it's not, the 600 megahertz band is not, uh, okay. doesn't have a coverage all, over the entire United States yet. Okay. Uh, okay. They are uh, so. So in few years, T-Mobile might become a, do a very dominant player in the rural area because they have more frequency. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And another, one more thing, Mike. In in yeah. the question about hills and canopies, it it doesn't mean that the technology is not feasible. It means it may need like more vertical assets to do shorter hops, right? right. So, Okay, yeah. And Jerry, that leads to me to my question about the impact of hops on network efficiency and capability. So, so it, it would hit latency, but I'm not sure if the user would really uh, see that, um, Mike or Co. Yeah, yeah, the, the user would see that. They would see that the more hops typically, well, step back. Um, it depends on if it's a true hop or not, because most cell sites, are connected directly to a fiber. Can we talk about what a hop is? I'm assuming it means going from one tower to the next, hopping along. Yes. Like a, like a repeater. Okay, thank you. Right, thank right, you. right. Okay. Yeah. And so it's All just right. important to get fiber to as many of your towers in a fixed wireless network as possible so I, that... Uh, absolutely. Though right. in some places, the network operators also use wireless technologies to connect from the tower to tower using yeah. point to point. So separate from the cellular bands. Right. Yeah, you, you'll, you might see these cone-shaped types of fixtures on cell towers that are in the middle of nowhere, and, and they're usually pointing to another tower. Um, there's a question about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of 5G unlicensed. So the unlicensed 5G, okay, that is coming up there. It is possible to do that in the, some of the new Wi-Fi bands. Um, some of that's going to be done by the, the cellular providers. They're using that spectrum to complement their existing bands. Uh, but there also is the possibility for private networks to also be done there. However, if you're in the unlicensed bands, typically there's a quite a bit of a technical restrictions on what you can do, which limit your 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 range, uh, you know, at least for an unlicensed operation. There's a another question in the chat about the the use of T-Mobile for home internet. And, mm -hmm. and that's something that, that we're seeing, it, it kind of came out of COVID in the rural areas where home internet, like uh, previously, you know, to get a, a lot of data from a Verizon or a T-Mobile was, was very expensive. Um, but now we're starting to see a lot of home modems with pretty decent pricing. Um, and you see a lot of commercials for you know, get your home internet through T-Mobile or through Verizon or AT&T. And, and I expect that we, I expect to see a lot more of that as well. It's good to see that it's being well received because that's, that's utilization of, of capabilities that are already existing mm -hmm. in many areas. Good. Um, yeah. What, what do you guys have uh, much uh, predictions on the cellular home internet product? Is that going to be a, a dominant thing for rural? And I know that T-Mobile advertises a 50 meg connection, I think for 50 bucks 
is kind of their hook. It'd be great if there was cell phone service. Right. <laughs> that, 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 that's, 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 the, that's the key. If there's no cell phone yeah. service, it, it's, it's, it's not likely, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I hope to see more of that. Um, I, I can tell you I have, I have a 200-acre farm east of Raleigh, and I keep trying to get T-Mobile or Verizon rural internet service, and they keep telling me it's not available, even though I have cellular service out there. <laughs> so I, I hope to see that that, that does become bigger, but it's, it, it kind of depends on, I think, their, their network and um, how much how much they can, you know, how their network can support and how many users they can support. Good, good, thank you. You know, this has really been interesting and a great uh, foundation piece for like our communities to begin to put uh, all this in context between the different technologies, what's fixed wireless, what's mobile wireless, satellite, um, and, um, um, uh, question here on on messaging about uh, you know there's a fair number of uh, Elon Musk uh, backers who say you know the whole world is going satellite yeah. and we don't need fiber in rural areas. What's your take on that? I don't think well it's 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 all going to add up to more capabilities. Uh, not everybody is going to go to satellite because it's. It's, it's going to end up ultimately be cheaper uh, for a lot of users to stay on their cellular or some other WISP or something. Uh, the satellite, I've been, I've been looking at sa satellite for my own use. And again, it's, it's got, right now, it's, it's looking really good, uh, particularly since I can't get anything else. Uh, however, it's also, um, I'm not sure about the price. Uh, pricing is going what it's going to be. Is he's going to have to keep that pricing competitive, and eventually there's going to be so many satellites up there. I don't know. At, at some point, you've got to believe that um, maintaining all those thousands of satellites is going to get really expensive. <laughs> uh, but but it's a it's a great technology that I think will complement everything else. So, um, Anthony, since I know that this is your one board member who thinks satellite is going to solve every problem, it's really interesting that even at the congressional level, there is a request that USDA price out the cost of doing a satellite network for rural areas versus the cost of bringing fiber. So there's a huge um, discussion about this as a substitute for bringing fiber, but that Mike has pointed out uh, several issues. One is the cost of installation plus monthly. The, um, of course, the low orbit satellites the, uh, are gonna have less latency problems, but still have weather issues. And then this idea that uh, the more people who get onto Starlink, the more, for it to perform the more satellites he has to put up. And so these are all things that are sort of unknowable at this point. Uh, and so I would tell you that um, it's a big question mark. It's a big question mark. Someone just wrote something very interesting in the chat about this. China to launch, yeah. their, yes, to suppress <laughs> must yeah, like, wow. My, my understanding is the Chinese is looking at it more as a military um, yeah. application than, than for consumer. So I'm, I'm not sure that their 13,000 satellites are going to help us with internet access. <laughs> right. And <laughs> actually, it's absolutely true. Anna points out that there is a current wait list for, yeah. for Starlink. Some people try to get around it by doing the RV version, right. um, and that's causing some issues, too. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that that's exactly right there. They basically, even though I'm not sure how many satellites they have up currently, but they don't have enough that they can, uh, they feel they can offer service to everybody in the US, you know, that wants it. So It's actually not just a, a board member that has expressed this as we've had conversations in the community, there seems to be a um, 
I don't want to just generalize it as a pocket, but there does seem to be some of the mindset that that's just not good usage of money. Um, you know, and I've always have countered that with the fiber. And, and I think one of the previous calls that we had, there was theoretical and they've proven out you could get 100 gig symmetrical out of fiber, um, which is going to future proof. Uh, but I'm just curious, since you guys work in this wireless space all the time, what your thoughts were on the satellite side and, and how would you address or counter that type of sentiment? Because it's not just a board member. There are others in our community that have the same perspective. Thank you, Anthony. I think it's been mentioned by the people in Hancock and Skylar too is coming up. Yeah. yeah. Satellite, to my thinking, satellite, there's, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure up there that's required to install it. Of course, the same true of, of fiber or whatever, although not quite as much. Um, satellite is also, it's, it's, it's brittle. Uh, all we need is a couple of, of, of collisions, and all of a sudden, we're going to have a lot of space debris up there. And when that happens, we may well see these, these uh, satellite systems suddenly becoming a lot less reliable. Um, in an ideal world, yeah, it's, it's a great technology. But it's also the, the latency issue. Even with Starlink, although Starlink is low Earth orbit, um, I've seen numbers of people who are testing it, they're still seeing... 100 millisecond plus uh, latencies out of some Starlink links. It's not consistent because, of course, the satellites are constantly moving. And again, depending upon the application, you have some applications, it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's no problem. But things like VOIP and, and video calls and things, uh, when those latencies start getting up there above 100 milliseconds, then uh, it, it, it becomes a less enjoyable experience. Well, and for our friends in the woods, you know, that uh, the traditional satellite, you need one uh, view of where your satellite is. You might have to cut down one tree, but for Starlink, they're coming and going. And so you need to be able to have a much bigger view of the sky to have that high quality connection. I'll also mention, and you know, I'm not um, a technology expert here, but in the field of community and economic development, we like to point out the fact that if you have local, affordable, high-speed internet, that's going to attract new residents. It's going to attract businesses regionally, even internationally. It's on a top three list for uh, attracting businesses if you have that high-speed internet locally, if you have that capacity. Um, and the other thing is that it would be a community asset um, in other regards as well. So, you know, for continued development, uh, community and, and economic development, uh, you're going to want to have that local durable capacity. I think that's a great point, Nancy, that, you know, a, a fiber network is a, even a bunch of uh, towers in your county connected by fiber. You know, that's an infrastructure that's not going anywhere. But it, you know, a privately owned company that would, where the owner could say, well, I'm sick of this, we're done. You know, a whole county could be out or a whole <laughs> rural areas could be out of service in one day with no capacity to restart that service. You know, if you have a fiber network and it all operator goes bankrupt or whatever, that asset is still gonna be there. Somebody else could operate that. And uh, I don't think the satellites fit that same uh, infrastructure category. One, one scenario that we've been advocating uh, is a kind of a, a neutral hosted wireless network for areas that don't have that 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 high speed access over a wide area, and it and it starts off as a community asset, and and it allows for all of the carrier so it's neutral so you can have all of the main cellular carriers as well as the wisps connect to it um and the key is that it provides wholesale access to the internet which is a barrier for many of the wisps as well to get onto vertical assets so that and that, that's something that again if they go away, like you said bill if they go the company goes away the asset is still there and it's still valuable to the community um
Good, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Uh, great, great discussion today. And uh, you know, we uh, we're also seeing, and I might have missed this today, is that a lot of the fixed wireless companies now are going to a kind of a 4G LTE advanced solution uh, where the WiMAX is probably less, I think that's generally been eclipsed, I think by the 4G LTE. And so that's where, that's what you're gonna see most on. That CBRS is a very interesting example where we've seen, uh, for example, school districts using their connectivity to get, uh, you know, they have a fiber to their buildings they put radios on top of the buildings and then shoot out, you know, essentially free internet to their students. And it's as a, uh, generally that's on a best offering available kind of thing. They don't try and say, oh, we're gonna, let's go build a lot more towers, but it's a convenience factor where they can, for a relatively low cost, uh, but this might be more in your county seat community, right? Off, off the top of your high school, uh, which serves my, one of the affordability issues, maybe that instead of buying a bunch of hotspots for kids, you're using CBRS, but it's not necessarily a rural solution. So it's all part of that puzzle, once again. Uh, thank you, Bill. So I do want to say that uh, the WRC personnel are going to make themselves available to talk to each of the counties. Um, couple, you know, one to two hours tops. Uh, the second thing is that they will be working up um, sort of some model scenarios that we will deliver later in the um, uh, schedule. And so Jerry, um, I don't know if you wanna say anything about those models for people just to give them a sense of what's coming. So, um, yeah, what's what we're planning to do, and, and we're going to be looking at the feedback from the surveys to see each each of the counties kind of where the counties are at and, and then kind of curate some modeled solutions of uh, what we would recommend. And, and as, as Adrian, men Adrian mentioned, we are available for questions. Um, you know, we're really here to, to help educate the community and to move us all forward as well um, and to demystify the technology. Good, thanks. Right. And I think those models will show, well, here's what technologies are best for the flatland, here's what's best for the hills. And really you should be able to see yourself as a county in those models. It might not be one model, it might be two or three uh, systems that need to be implemented for your best solution. Right. It, it prepares it prepares each county for kind of a feasibility analysis. You know, what do we do next? You know, and it rather than being at the mercy of somebody, you know, everything's a nail if they're selling a hammer. Right. Um, so we'll be able to, to at least help you guys understand the dynamics as well. Um, Good. Thank you. Thanks, well, Jerry. Thanks, WRC team. That was great. Really, really appreciate it. As I said, I always learn more uh, each time I do one of these. Thank you guys so much. Mike, really appreciate your clarity and the glossary at the end. And Nancy will make the slides available to everybody. Thank you. Good. good. Uh, Nancy has some uh, survey information. Yep, just real quickly, I will provide a temporary tool for you all to use in your breakouts today to um, get eyes on your survey coverage. Um, really great job collecting information about satisfaction rates and speeds, et cetera. Um, all that information is going to be really important. You're going to see that coverage today. Um, and so I will give you that tool to use. You will be able to view it and also um, manipulate it. Um, and that will help you just quickly, you know, just even five minutes, develop a, a list, uh, just a quick list that you can um, use for targeting for continued cluster sampling with your surveys. So I'll provide that and those are going to be available to you just for a short period of time today. Um, and so, um, Ogle, you'll, you are special 
uh, but the rest of you will get that and Ogle, you'll get that um, at the end. You're, you're the caboose today. And um, so uh, that's all I have, Bill. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Uh, let's go to our uh, breakout rooms and you can uh, continue all your discussions on visions, surveys, uh, next week's uh, meetings, whatever you feel most productive in your time uh, uh, to tackle. So uh, in our, you'll have your uh, community liaisons with you and I'll also be around and, and uh, uh, Nancy as well. So thanks everyone.